Welcome to the East Bridgewater School Committee meeting of February 14th, 2019. At this time, I would take a motion to open the meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Gordon, second by Rob. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, <clears throat> at this time, I would ask if there was anyone here for the public comment section. Seeing no one, we'll continue on. This evening, we have Hillary Dubois and Police Chief Scott Allen, and they're going to discuss uh, issues associated with vaping. And vaping happens to be part of the One Voice campaign this month. Um, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for having us. Um, so we have been barked on uh, trying to address some of the concerns around vaping, um, which are not just here in East Bridgewater, but in all of the neighboring communities. Um, they're pervasive. They go through the high school into the middle school. I think um, Principal Duffy probably had hair back before the whole thing started. And it's you know been something that a lot of communities have been overwrought with in terms of determining um, disciplinary actions, in terms of managing it, really with, in the confines of still maintaining school every day. Um, we had completed a survey at the beginning of the school year. Um, the data is uh, available, and we've seen you know, pretty much consistent um, in some of our measures, 30-day use has gone up a little bit. Perceptions about um, harm have gone down, but generally an understanding that parents don't think it's okay. And then if you look at peer perceptions, it's sort of equally um, spread out across the quadrants in terms of if they think it's a great risk or no risk. So uh, earlier this month, we did some focus groups with um, seventh and eighth grade students and with juniors and seniors. And it was really enlightening to hear from the youth their perspective. Um, when we talked to the students in terms of what they thought were the most prevalent substances of use, they said alcohol, marijuana, and didn't really even consider that vaping was a drug. Um, when we dug a little bit deeper, they talked about how, yes, in fact, nicotine was a drug, but didn't necessarily align that with vaping. Vaping's not necessarily just um, nicotine-based products. It might also include THC, which is something that sort of, I think, varies community by community. Um, but the, the products and the devices look fairly similar. Um, so the, all of the youth in both classes discussed that about um, every three to four times they use the restroom, there's someone vaping in the bathroom. Um, some students talked about how it was disruptive to their experience within the classrooms. Other talked about how it created an awkward environment when they would go to the restroom so they wouldn't use the restroom. Um, one of the things that was really surprising and I think important to note, um, and it might have been because we were within health classes, was both the juniors and seniors and the seventh and eighth graders, they knew that vapes all included nicotine, they knew that they were addictive, they understood the harms associated with them, but whether or not they perceived it as being harmful was not necessarily sort of standard across the board. Um, they understood and knew and recognized that some of their peers were addicted to vaping. Um, some kids talked about how they knew friends that tried to stop and they couldn't. Um, they talked about their feelings and perspective towards consequences. In both classes, they talked about that it went all throughout the high school and the middle school. And then both classes also discussed that they knew of fifth and sixth graders that were vaping. And that might sound really shocking, but we hear that in all of the districts that we work with. So what we're working on is trying to create some best practices um, through my organization around how communities and schools can support students and uh, address the vaping issue. Um, information and resources for parents. I think a lot of parents don't know what vaping products look like. They're very diverse in terms of shape and size. Um, we're looking at providing some information and resources for professional development for staff and faculty so that they can recognize when something that looks like maybe a USB in the computer or looks like um, 
a battery for a phone might be charging in their classroom and they might not even realize that it's a vape. Um, so it was providing some information education to the adults I think would be really important. I think the youth know how prevalent it is. They know that in some place, instances, students are kind of trying to up the ante and become more and more brazen in their use. So it's not just the bathrooms. It might be in classrooms. It might be in hallways. And I think within certain groups, there's this um, active thought about how to be a little bit more brazen about it. So if we can better inform adults, it might help um, to address the issue. But realizing that right now a lot of the vaping um, information and resources are so new that um, it's hard to kind of figure out really a hands-on approach to address it. So it definitely is a, a multifaceted, multi-sector approach. You know, just to, re uh, to you know, if for those that aren't familiar with Hillary, her group through the High Point Treatment Center, she's the director of programs. So we've worked collectively between the school, the police department, EB Hope, PCO Hope on substance use. And we have our monthly meetings chaired by Dr. Williams with the superintendent at the school with a combination of our teams and the district attorney's office. And during those discussions, this has just become a, uh, you know, it's, it's our number one topic. For those that didn't see, the Surgeon General declared it an epidemic right now for vaping for, for use. And it's a challenge, it presents a challenge, obviously, at the school, for the, for the police department. You know, we're actually working, I attended a meeting lab just before the holidays with the uh, uh, Public uh, Board of Health, where the, we're looking to update our local um, regulations, because vaping obviously was not, you know, you know, around, you know, years ago, never mind, you know, 20, 30 years ago when, the, when they first, you know, developed these regulations. So we'll, we will be updating those. For those that don't know, it is now illegal to buy tobacco under the age of 21, but there is a grace period now, too, for people that were born before December 31st, 2018. So those are some of the challenges that we're dealing with on the law enforcement side. And again, we're looking at it from the, uh, the public health lens, you know. You know, we have kids we know and from talking at the school that, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh graders and there's kids that can't stop and, and they're trying to and it's, you know, it's very concerning because it's another, you know, um, you know, piece of this, you know, puzzle, puzzle that we're trying to, you know, combat with all the other substances out there, never mind now adding vaping to the mix. And, um, you know, again, it's something we're educating and working collectively on together. <clears throat> and we're going to work with Independence Academy with Ryan. Um, up uh, at the North River Collaborative uh, Independence Academy started this uh, a new at-risk program. It's called Upper Course. Um, he he'll be here probably at the end of February, uh, beginning of March, to speak to the to the school committee. Uh, we may go to policy on this because it's a behavior that we need to stop. We certainly, but it, it's it's a drug, and. Um, just like EB Hope, just like a lot of the coalition, we don't want to punish kids um, for their use because it's an addictive drug. Nicotine is very, very addictive, but there is other things. We want to change their behavior and give them knowledge and to provide them an opportunity to learn about it, to understand about it, and to turn, turn around. And that's what Independence Academy does. Um, yes, they do have students there who are, um, it's a, at risk school, um, but he's designed this upper course for students who are vaping because it is one of our number one, well, it is the number one issue right now in the South Shore. Um, there's not a principal or a superintendent who doesn't talk about it on, in any meeting, that this is just huge. We're hearing from Plymouth right now who put the first detectors in. They're saying they're going off at a rate, they, they wanna turn them off because they're going off so much that the assistant principals can't keep up with the text comes from the, the, the smoke or whatever it emits, the fume, the vapor uh, emits, and it sets off a signal that texts the principal or assistant principals, who's ever, assistant principal gets it, he knows which, or she knows which bathroom to go to, they go, by the time they're there, kids have gone in or out, might not even be the, the student who set it up, but there may be somebody else in there. So, um, and they just, we can't keep up with it because it's so prevalent, it's an epidemic. Um, but uh, we'd like to, I'd like to bring that to the district um, and to let parents know we're going to take it very seriously. And on their first, uh, what, you know, is it on the, on the first time we catch them vaping or is it their second time? On their first or second, we're going to go very, we're, we're going to be rigorous on this and they will be out of school and they will go directly to the Independence Academy up at Upper Course. I think it's the best way to go. It's the only way we're going to deter this. And um, if we don't take a measure, and step forward, we're going to continue to just slide down the slope. What, what is sending them to Independence Academy? 
they go, it's called the Upper Course. It's Independence Academy. It's up in back of Brockton High School. It's in an old, it's in an old, I think, elementary school um, that they took over. And they would go up and they would have English, math um, in the day, but they also have a social, uh, emotional um, healing period. That's why I want him to come talk a little bit more about it. But they also have a core, uh, like a, probably about an hour. Um, it's 10 to 2. It's during the day. It's, a, it's, it's an alternative to out-of-school suspension, which we do not do here. We do most of our in-school suspensions unless it is a zero tolerance. This is becoming a zero tolerance issue for us. Um, it's an illegal drug. They're illegal to have for kids under the age of 21. So how they're getting it, I have no idea. But they're bringing it into school, so, I'm, so I'd like to deem it zero tolerance. They would leave here, go, go to independent, go to, uh, upper course at the Independence Academy, and they would be brief or get a course on vaping and the dangers of vaping. And they would have also have um, a English class and a math class during the day. And then social and, and some social and social emotion uh, healing period. I think that's what Ryan calls it. I'm not sure, but. It's a one day program? It could be, it could be one day. It could be three days. It could be as many days as we would like. I'd like to go one for one. It's six. It's sixty-three dollars a day for us to send a student there Does for this. Does it? No. But out of school. So what? What? If if I was a parent. It, but this is what I'm saying. This is how we're gonna. I, I'd like to talk to parents about. about the math. We don't do that. We don't do transportation for it. Um, how does that get covered? The parents. Okay. But as Dr. Williams and I uh, have attended um, two in a, in a law conference that now um, DESE will use that as a, a day in school, uh, will not count against the student was suspended. It'll count as a day of the student participated in school, so it won't count against them. So it's a win-win for the student. It's a win-win for the parent, and it's a win-win for the school. If we can deter students for using <clears throat> this and, and move it around. Um, unless, I hope that we can have parents, like, like Hillary just said, if, if our parents and, and the, um, the community could help us stop this, that would be the way to go. How many kids are we talking about? How many students do you think we're looking <laughs> I mean, at? I defer to the school, but it's, you know, it's problematic. And, you know, maybe so uh, one of the things that the school districts are doing is they're giving options. So it can be an out-of-school yeah. suspension, and it would be you know an unexcused absence yeah. um, and missing that instruction for the day. Which or the this. option, instead of taking those days out of school uh, suspension, they would have this other alternative. And so like the superintendent said, it wouldn't be on their, their record <coughs> as being suspended or uh, unexcused absence because for us, we want them to still get their education and we want them to still get that knowledge and understanding of the importance of the dangers. So for us, you know, it's not so much that we want kids to be punished mm -hmm. through unexcused absences and suspensions on their records. Most importantly, we want them um, to learn about the dangers and, and make better decisions. But are we talking about number of kids? kids. Is that what, yeah, yeah just the just sheer percentage like the, the raw number is it? One percent is it? Two percent? I don't it? think anyone knows for sure. How do we know? Right. It's, it's, it's so early on. I know that there was a stat, right. and Hillary might have it. You know, ninety percent of the kids polled in the last two years have said they've experimented at least one time. You know, one time within this one study. I mean, this, it's so early on for data, but I'll turn to Hillary here. So, from the <laughs> survey that was conducted this fall, self-reported. 16% of students in the schools in grade 8, 9, 11, and 12, 16% reported any use. Wow. I don't think that's accurate based on what the focus groups said. Do we think that 8th grade is the point of entry to... Oh, God. No. No, we had a 5th grader. I'm, I'm saying this as a father yeah. of a 3rd yeah. grader. Rob, right. we had a 5th grader. Yeah. We had a Mitchell School student that was vaping. This is not an isolated high school issue or middle school issue. This is an issue that is going, um, and it is, uh, to, the, to the chief, he would tell, it's an epidemic and it's flying. And I think that because it looks like a, 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 a USB, a USB yeah. it doesn't look harmful. 
kids third, fourth, fifth grade are putting it in their mouth, not thinking anything of it. I did not realize, I was just told the other day that these USBs that you, know, you plug into the side of your laptop or to your hard drive, those are vapes. Those are pen jewels. Yep, and they're charging them on the computers in the school. And just a quick this. So 90% of all smokers start before the age of 18. 3,000 minors a day in the United States are experimenting. So it is absolutely challenging. And kudos to you know the school, Mr. Leonard, the athletic director, Mr. S Coach Savage, for you know part of that One Voice campaign. Yep. You know that, that Ms. Pennington talked about was um, you know a great great leadership by the school in bringing that awareness at the Middleborough East Bridgewater High School varsity game. For those that got there last week, it was a great, a very well attended event, and it was just to bring that awareness. And, and some of the quotes that Hillary and her staff took from the focus study were actually you know, read to the crowd and, and really, you know, enlightened as a parent, you know, some of the things their, their peers are saying, you know, about their peers that are using, um, you know, that are vaping. It, Our upperclassmen have done a really nice job, too, with it, you know, some of the Instagram videos and, and stuff and promotions that they've done. Uh, Mr. Duffy had assemblies today for all the grades, uh, and it was, you know, for me to hear from students saying, uh, that they think the consequences need to be more strict. Um, and, you know, you don't often hear kids <laughs> saying that. I agree with that 100%. I, I have a couple concerns with sending kids to another school for an entire day. Uh, would, would the school pay for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, someone who's physically addicted to something, you can sit them down and give them a lecture about how what they're doing is bad, but they're physically addicted to it. Um, I find it hard to believe in this day and age, the internet, that anyone over the age of 12 doesn't know that nicotine is bad for you and vaping is bad for you. Um, I, I agree with the kids. I think we need to do something that makes kids realize that's, you can't do that here. Right, I, I agree with you, John, but sending them home, they can vape at home and they're gonna find it. Independence Academy is a tested, um, at-risk school and it is um, one of five mm -hmm. in the state and it is one of the highly touted um, substance abuse schools, high schools in the Commonwealth. Um, Ryan is a, um, a leader of that school. He is uh, a good principal but he has and he has engulfed himself in knowledge and he brings in the police, he brings in other people. The people that work for him are just not public educators. They have a full-time psychologist, a full-time um, substance abuse preventative uh, counselor. Um, so the kids don't just go there and hear how bad vaping is. They hear about the whole gamut of what's going on. And the students that go there, there could be a heroin user that is there. They, they test students on arrival every morning. They test their heart rate during the day. They have a full-time nurse or nurse practitioner on site. I mean, they have heavy hitters of heroin, cocaine, crack. Um, I mean, all the drugs, oxycodone. Unfortunately, this is, this is pushing us into that arena. I don't want us to be into that arena. And I mean, there's other ways of looking at this. I'm listening to other superintendents, other principals. We're having a tough time getting a handle on this. Can I, um, can I ask you, uh, what's the capacity of the school? Um, how, many, how, many, how many students can be there at any given time? I think full-time students is 30, 40, yeah. but I think for 40, the day 30. program, I don't know for the day program, for, for full-time students it's 40. Okay. Are they a nonprofit right now, or it, for profit? They're a uh, nonprofit, fund, you know, regulated by DESE. They were originally funded through the Department of Public Health Bureau of Substance Abuse Services. And they part in North River Collaborative houses them, our collaborative. So we, we get a lot of work on this. And I have to tell you that I'm one, I was um, probably the biggest advocate for this upper course. I was the one who pushed it at North River. Um, I feel that we need something like this. Even, and I don't, even, I don't like to say this, Chief, but even low level, the, the usage of marijuana, because it has become legal, kids think because it's legal to sell it or to buy it, that it's okay. I don't think it's okay. Um, but even that we could send to the upper course. I mean, if we got into that, and we, we, I haven't seen much, of, we don't hear much of that. We, we have had a couple of THC, um, you know, devices, you know, the electric cigarette devices, but it's not as prevalent as the actual vaping. But again, you know, Department of Public Health stats will tell you, and Hillary brought it to my attention about five years ago, 
you know, first use of alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, the earlier that first use is, the age of onset, the higher the, the risk factors, you know, formulate on developing a substance use later on in life. So again, those are the, the things that we're concerned about. I agree with John. We want to educate as much yeah. as, and, and get out there early, make, earlier the better, you know, earlier the age the better. Um, and, but again, it is so overwhelming right now. I, I, I think you could probably just about go to any school and spend the day, you know, grabbing kids with vapes and or vaping that, you know, I, what the superintendent saying, we've got to try to think outside the box, I think, on, uh, on how to, you know, really get control of this. <clears throat> I certainly uh, am in full support of the program. Sounds like it's, it makes sense. It isn't just sending the kids home, punishing them. To your point, John, you're right. If, if some kid's already, ad already addicted, one day out of school is probably not going to do it. I would think you'd want to hope to get that kid who's maybe just starting and get caught and then get him off track. But to me, the absolute biggest picture is if you think all the way, as uh, Chief Allen just said, all the way to the youngest, whatever level you want to put it at, is to teach the kids about individuality and uh, peer pressure. Uh, as, as I've grown up over many a decade and you know, experienced a lot of whatever has been out there in society, it's, it's amazing to me what peer pressure does. And if you don't know how to, you know, I can't say control it, but how do you, how do you process it, then you get caught up in that, well, hey, everybody's doing it and you're not cool if you don't. If you can somehow, some way, I, I certainly support everything that's going on. I, I would love to see that there's, there's programs happening in first, second, third, fourth grade to tell kids, it's okay, you're an individual, you're totally unique. Just because somebody else is doing something, you don't have to do it. You make your own choices and you listen to people who are older than you, are smarter than you to say, eh, that's probably not a good thing to do. Um, that to me is where it's fundamentally, it, I, you know, you talk about drinking and drugs and it all, I've heard the same thing years after years, it goes earlier and earlier and if we don't have some sort of organized approach to that, well, it's always going to be thus, that, you know, the time to catch somebody and, and you're not going to catch everybody and, and I don't mean catch in the sense of catching them doing something they shouldn't do, but catch their thought process early enough in its development to say, I'm strong enough uh, to say, I don't, I don't have to do that. Uh, you do whatever you're going to do. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Make fun of me. Do whatever you want to do. But there's no way I'm drinking. There's no way I'm vaping. There's no way, you know, and, and just to start to show some support for that kind of thought process, that it isn't something to be scorned. It's something to be admired, that somebody can step out from the crowd and say, I'm, I'm all set. Thank you very much. Uh, so to me, that's the fundamental piece. Whether it's vaping now, who knows what it's going to be two years or two days from now. Somebody's going to think of something else that's cool. And uh, so it's that, that fundamental piece that teaches kids, uh, it, it's okay. It's okay to say no. You know, make your own choice. Don't do it because everyone else is doing it. Uh, Gordon, anyway. I, I agree 100%. And, and I think the education part is a big part, particularly when they're younger. Um, but I, I also think at the older grades, particularly in the high school, and sadly it sounds like at the Mitchell, we need to get the kids that are doing it. And, oh. I mean, kids have been smoking tobacco since there was tobacco that right. was commercially sold. It used to be easy. You could smell the kids who had had a cigarette out of gym class. Can't do that anymore with the vaping. Um, what, what are we doing to catch the kids that are? I mean, we need to let them know uh, you don't do that in this building. You know, we, we can't police the kids when they're outside of school, but you know, I'm fine with coming down on them like a ton of bricks if they're caught in the school building. I agree, and that's one of the reasons I'd like Ryan to come and just talk about the program. The other thing, we understand that kids are vaping in the hallway. Mm -hmm. They can hide it, and they're blowing it in their jacket, uh, in their shirts, uh, backpacks, we've heard. They're going into the stalls. They're going in... Uh, nurse's bathroom. Nurse's bathroom. Any pla every place. Every place. The, and the lookout. We have the behavior the specialist, the, the behavior specialist, the assistant principal, the principal. They're walking in and out of bathrooms. You know, we're, we're working on our teachers to uh, work with us um, and to everybody in and out of those bathrooms all the time. Uh, Mr. Duffy put um, teachers on bathroom duty this year. Um, we're running into some attendance issues uh, with our, our faculty. Do, do, you know, it's winter. We've got 
the colds and the flu and um, their own children sick. So we have an attendance issue. So then we got to get into coverage issue. And that means that we have nobody watching the bathroom. So because we need to watch a classroom of 35 so that nobody could be out in the hallway watching a bathroom. So it's just, it's a compounding problem. And it's one of those things that we're just going to have to think outside the box so we can get a hold of it. So. How expensive are the detectors? Um, we saw some are at $1,000. We have saw one at $659, and I think the chief showed us one at $479. And then the yeah. software goes back yeah. as an additional cost. Yeah. So it's like one was $1,000. That was like the one that I think Plymouth had, and then there was the $659, and then there was one at $459. Um, we're still looking at, but we think they might come down. Because yeah, we're, we're thinking, we're still looking at them. Triggers that by the time the teacher gets down there, the kids are gone. Um, uh, you'll see it on our budget. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at putting them into the bathrooms. It's just, to catch a ghost. Uh, by the time you get there, Please. that's another of the issues. And part of it too is if knowing it's there, the awareness piece, it right. you know, may, may be less likely to yep. do it in the school, knowing that there's potential right. enforcement right. and or you know, consequences. So you know, certainly a deterrent factor mm -hmm. here. Right. How so it is in our. Do we have in the high school? How many? How many student bathrooms do we have? I couldn't tell you. I would say there's three on each floor, or two on each side. Is, um, say. Two on each side. And yeah, you got a ballpark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say there's two, two on a floor. One, you know, one set on one side and one set on the other. Cafeteria. Yeah. But again, cafeteria. Cafeteria. We hear is one of the biggest spots for it because they're all in a. They're all gathered, and if you have, you know, the assistant principals down there with five teachers in there um, proctoring and wa or watching, overseeing the cafeteria, along with Mrs. Vaughn, that are walking around. How many people are down there, Miss? About five at a time. Um, they're watching the cafeteria. They're watching, helping wash all the lines. Blowing into their jacket. Yeah. Like, and they're still, and then they're going into the bathroom. Doesn't really matter. All no, that much. that's a fair point. <laughs> so. But we are looking at it, you know, I think just having you come out this evening and just talk about it, that it's here, that we did do a survey, that, like you said, they'll self, <laughs> uh, they'll self-reflect, but will they um, always truthfully answer about myself? You never know. Um, but I think just this and then having Ryan come in, I mean, it's just another way for us to educate ourselves on what are we going to do? Um, you know, we, we've had some parents um, that have come in here and have challenged us about giving back the vape. You know, uh, the Juul, it's $59 and w w the pods are $20. I don't, I don't really know that much about it. But now if the principal has a problem, they bring it down to me. We put it, uh, we put it in a sealed package. I hand it to the SRO in a sealed package um, that's taped. We put the date on it and then they bring it up to the police station and they dispose of them. Um, we're not giving them back. SRO? School, huh? resource school resource officer. School resource officer. We have uh, Talitha we have Connor and then uh, Cecilia Cacciatore. Right. We have two of them. Uh, what's the, uh, how old do you have to be to buy a device? Well, 20, you've, 20 right, right now it's 21 years or older now. To and we, and we have team products, so. parents who want them back. Yes, mm -hmm. we have parents who have challenged us that they have bought this. It is their money. They want it back. It's theirs. Um, I've even asked. I, I did ask the DA when I was at a, a conference with him. He said it's in your school. If it is zero tolerance, if, if it is paraphernalia you do not want, it becomes yours. So I. I take them if the principals or the assistant principal gets nervous with a parent, you know, ask them, I just say, call me down, I'll come down, I'll take it. I, you know, and, and it's unfortunate, but that's where we're at. And I don't think that's unfortunate. I think it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I'm saying, well, it's, a, it's unfortunate. <laughs> it's back. unfortunate that that's it's, a, it's unfortunate that parents are, are, are buying um, vape. It could be on Prime, uh, Amazon, that you know the student goes home and he just orders it himself because they can get up on the Prime and uh, Amazon sells them. Yeah. So. I don't. That, that just. <laughs> I, there's a school of thought that if if you make this, if you come down hard enough, where the parents pay attention, they'll start regulating what's going on at home as well. John, we have people. We we've had parents, and I've had parents in the past take a p pack of cigarettes away from the kid. And the parents come in, and they want the pack of cigarettes back. I've had uh, 
lighters. I want that lighter back. No, I want that. Uh, you know, we've had um, uh, jackknives come in. Can't have it more. Well, you can't have a jackknife, even if it's a Swiss Army knife. Usually we'll just take it. It's one of those for, we had a, a, a student uh, with Cub Scouts last year who brought one in at the Mitchell School. Someone saw it. Mrs. Dupre took it, put it in her desk, had the parent come in it. Just don't bring it into school. But it was a, a, a Cub Scout that um, was a, made it to the next level, right? Um, and and it, it, so we, we need to make sure that we're, you know, uh, reasonable. But people will come in and say, I want, you know, why did he have that knife? I don't know why he's got a butcher knife okay. in his backpack, but it's now ours. So um, some parents, maybe takes them a little bit longer to understand. I don't know, but. Well, they just need to realize they can't, kid can't do it here. We, we can't police them at their home. Well, I agree with that, but I, when they I, come I, in and they bring a vape, when they bring a jewel in and then they, they, they uh, badger the principal or the assistant principal, give it back, give it back, give it back, give it back, or follow the school resource officer as she walks out with it in a bag saying, that's mine, I'm going up to the police station to get it, and the, the school resource officer says, no, you're not, because the school has deemed it inappro um, against their policy. So... It's going, to take the, it's going to take education for the community and for the adults as much as it is going to take for us in the health curriculum that we're looking at right now that uh, we're putting in and um, the D.A.R.E. program that we'll, we'll be looking at in the next couple of weeks, you'll start to see open up again at the Mitchell School. Um, they'll, that's one of the, the target points they're going to be hitting is the vaping. We just talked about this. Am I correct on that? How yeah. that's going to uh, the state is um, revamping the, the health standards and, and substance use prevention actually will be down in the lower grades. I mean, it's always been middle school, high school, and now it will start with the K-2 standards. Talking about just prescription medications at home and the dangers of, of you know, children um, taking medication that wasn't prescribed to them. Um, so I remember it was we a have, big deal when it, would, when it was going to be done in the junior high. Well, now I think we have to be careful, too, of telling kids not to take gummy bears. I mean, one of the schools just had 11 mm -hmm. elementary school kids yeah, eating the edibles. CBD gummies. and the edibles. Yeah, the, you'll see more, more and more prevalence as more and more retail shops become uh, in the area. And, and, and the, uh, Dr. Williams has <coughs> been talking curriculum for a couple of years now. You know, so for those in the public, we're not getting rid of deer. It's going to be health and wellness. They're still going to be, and it's actually going to be enhanced, um, you know, through this curriculum. So I... I, I think it's going to, you know, really be more beneficial moving forward here because we do need to get to these kids sooner and earlier, and it can't just be in the in the sixth grade. And I, I, collectively, we're all on that same uh, that mission, that focus. I think that's spot on. It's early, early, early. And Chief, I don't want to I don't want to rain on your parade, but I wanted to talk about the basketball game tonight that oh. we did the vaping at I, at, at halftime. <laughs> Chief Allen always does this to me. Always comes in here. And I want to give kudos to Mr. Duffy, though. I think I left his name up. But, I'll leave <laughs> you, so. but at the boys' basketball game a week ago against Middleborough, uh, they, had, um, uh, they talked about vaping and the issues where the parents were there, the students were there, the students spoke, uh, the coach spoke. I think it's... It's nice to see that we're starting to take a proactive approach, getting people involved. When we have a crowd um, at a game, maybe we start doing it at concerts. Um, you know, I, I continue to say we need to start making sure that people remember where the exits are before events, whether it's at the Mitchell School, whether it's at Central School in the cafeteria where Mrs. Byrne holds her events, or if it's at um, uh, the auditorium. You have two exits at the back, you have two exits up on top, you have two exits behind me, so that people understand that it's not just about exits and then we can go, we can go from there and then say, here's a little commercial on vaping. Maybe we get the audience. Maybe start, yeah, Use right. Three, maybe we start sending out some three by five cards at every meeting. This is what vaping can do to you. Smart. So. Thank you to Hillary and her team and uh, E.B. Hope, Susan Silva, yes. George Kelly, they were they're part of the One Voice campaign that, you know, Ellen, we, we sit on together. So it's, uh, it's great to see that community collaboration. We've been having our meetings down here, monthly meetings now, with Hillary's team down here at the school, which I think is critically important. <clears throat> great. Thank you. Thank you for Thank speaking you. about vaping tonight. Thank you for that work. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you. Um, next up, we have 
Matt Condon. He is uh, the East Bridgewater High School student. He's with the Student Advisory Council, and he's going to give us an update. And his sister's playing in the basketball game, so he's got to get back there. Welcome. And then run back and tell me the score. Absolutely. Good evening. Good evening. So March is a very exciting time up here at the high school. There's a lot of events planned by different clubs. So I've got two sheets of paper, so I'm just going to go for it. So. Student Senate has begun planning March Madness Week, which will be March 18th through the 22nd. This is the largest display of school spirit throughout the entire year. We encourage all students to sign up for an activity, participate in the Spirit Days, and buy their class color t-shirts. They have to talk to their executive committees to purchase those. Um, student Senate will also be selling rally towels this year. This is a new addition for us, and this will, be help, this will help us offset some of the cost. We have to fundraise a little bit. We spent a lot of money in the past few years on March Madness. So talk to Student Senate for the rally towels. They'll be in each class color for each student. Key Club will be hosting the Mr. EBHS competition on Friday, March 22nd at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. Tickets will be going on sale sometime in early March. Foreign Language Honor Society will be hosting Foreign Language Week. It, the date, the week is still be, to be determined. Uh, both the senior class and junior class are planning their proms. The seniors will be Thursday, March 23rd at Lake Pearl and Rentham. And the juniors will be Friday, May 3rd at Indian Pond Country Club in Kingston. The sophomore class is hosting a fundraising night at Chipotle in Brockton on Thursday, March 9th from 4 to 8 p.m. The freshman class is hosting a lock-in here at the school on Friday, March 1st from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. Tickets are $15 and, we, and will be sold through Thursday, February 28th. National Honor Society will be hosting a dodgeball tournament after school sometime in March. The week is still to be determined. There's a lot of music events coming up. Tomorrow, the senior jazz band, junior jazz band, and Rhythmics will be, will be performing three shows for all grades here at the high school. And following vacation, they'll be attending the Cape Cod Jazz Festival on Monday, March 4th. And then for the first three weekends in March, they'll be attending the, some music students will be attending the All-State Music Festival, the Junior District Festival, and the Senior Semspa Festival. Drama delivered their Valentine's Day candy grams today. And last week, math team competed in their final meet of the season. They scored a total of 30 points, and that was the highest scoring meet of the season. Wow, awesome. Yes. Very good. So that's it. So March, very busy time. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good. Good Great. to have Thank a you. student advisory council update. We haven't had one in a while, so good to have you guys back. Could I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but what is the foreign language major? So they're still is figuring... Is Spanish in the halls? Or <laughs> it's a collaboration with uh, the Spanish students and French students. It's usually like the, the students in French 3 and 4. Yeah. They just kind of plan some events. I know last year they had like a movie after school. They usually do some information on the morning announcements. Like they talk about a famous Spanish painter. So it just depends. They're still figuring out what they're going to do. It's not fair to me. Matt, are you going to France? I'm not. I went to Spain. Spain last, last year, right? <clears throat> okay. Uh, the, it's full. The trip is full. Yeah. I'm understanding, right? Yeah. yeah. I think this may be around 80. I could be completely off on that number, but I know it's a large number. I know it's a very large number. I didn't know if you were going. You going, Dr. Williams? A lot of people are excited, even the teachers. They're already <laughs> I'm sure they're, they're ready. ready for April vacation. <laughs> Joanne, are you going? No, I, I've been asked to share at 29 to 12 at the half. And the basketball game. All right. Us? Yes. Okay, very good. This is for the divisional title. So this is very big for us. This is a girls basketball. Huh? <laughs> Hence the parking. Yes. And plus there is uh, college uh, here at AIC today. So, thanks, Thank Matt. Thank you. 29 Thank to 12 you. at the half. <laughs> um, and in the interest of time, John has to leave this evening. He has to leave early. So we're going to run through the action items really quickly. Uh, so the first up, we, if that's okay with everyone, which I'm assuming it is. Um, so the first up, I would take a motion to approve the school committee meeting minutes from January 23rd, 2019 and January 31st, 2019. So moved. moved. Moved by Gordon, second by Hazel. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I would take a motion to approve the accounts payable warrant 32V dated 
January 22nd, 2019, and 34B dated to, uh, February 7th, 2019. So moved. Second. Moved by Gordon, second by Hazel. All in favor? Aye. And I would take a motion to approve payroll warrant 33 PS dated February 6th, 2019. So moved. Moved by Gordon. Second. Second by Hazel. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I would take a motion to approve um, changing the evening of the school committee meetings from Thursday to Tuesday effective with the 2019-20 school year. This was tabled about two or three times. Already. I thought we tabled that we did to table after it. it, to after the new oh, the election. The election. <laughs> no, I didn't think. Did we? I yeah. think you did, so that I know it, I it would give everybody else another. It would give if there's any new people an opportunity. So table till after, um, after 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 elections. Okay. Actually, speaking of the election, before I run, I was up at the clerk's office dropping off my papers, and she expressed concern again. The, run is going to be the day of the election again okay that's up next so just hold that thought it's up next hold that thought oh. no it's not on the agenda but hold that thought okay um so let me just finish these action items first and then i'll get to the next thing so um i would take a motion so we tabled the f changing this date the days um i would take a motion to uh let's see Dr. Williams, uh, the assistant superintendent, has reviewed the home education pro plan for the attached student for the 2018-19 school year. And Superintendent Legault recommends its approval. I'd take a motion to approve that at this time. So moved. Moved by Hazel. Second. Second by Gordon. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And I would take a motion to approve the proposed 2019-20 school calendar, which is in your packet. So moved. Moved by Gordon. Second. Second by Rob. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Is that a unanimous? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and at this time, I would take a motion to approve the very generous donation of $350 from the East Bridgewater Public Schools Athletics Booster to the East Bridgewater Junior Senior High School Athletics Program. So moved. Second. Moved by Gordon. Second by Hazel. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you to the EBPS Athletic Boosters. That was very nice. Um, so <clears throat> on to my next thing. So I'm going to skip this because I know John has to leave. So I'm going to go through this quickly. So uh, we're on the report of subcommittees and standing committees. I don't think we have any updates. But I did want to mention to everybody that I attended the Selectman's meeting on Monday, February 11th. And um, so the town meeting, which you probably all know, but I'm saying it for the community too, that the town meeting date was voted on and approved to be pushed out to June 10th. And we thank the selectmen for voting to approve that change. And our public hearing has been rescheduled for Tuesday, March 5th at 7 p.m. in the auditorium at the Junior Senior High School. Mr. John Shea, our business administrator and Superintendent Legault will give a budget presentation with a real needs budget and a 2% budget and what that impact will be of only a 2% budget. We will be certifying our budget on March 5th after the presentation. And <clears throat> next up, <clears throat> I would like to address the emails that I received, um, but I want to address them in a correct manner because, um, well, I'll, I'll get into that. So I received emails on January 17th, February 5th, and February 11th requesting agenda items, and the agenda was already set for the January 23rd meeting, and this is our first meeting in February, not including the 31st, which was a special edition with the executive session and just a quick open meeting. Um, agenda item requests require planning and preparation, which takes time, and I did not respond via email because I didn't want to create a dialogue back and, back and forth. And our open meeting law allows for boards and committees to use email exchanges for scheduling purposes, and we're not permitted to deliberate via email. I, asked, I ask that you be patient and continue to request agenda items via email. So the following agenda item requ items requested are um, <clears throat> bullying, which happens to be a part of the One Voice campaign and is a town-wide initiative. Bullying is on our agenda for the first March meeting. Um, our policy, JICFB, Bullying Prevention, addresses bullying as well as cyberbullying, and this policy was approved by the school committee last April 12, 2018, and is based on Massachusetts general law. <clears throat> um, Let's see. And because we're in a review cycle for health and wellness, both physical and mental, a couple of bullying programs are being researched to see which one or both works best for our needs. 
And the district also has a bullying and bullying prevention presentation coming up on Wednesday, February 27th at 6.30 in the Junior Senior High School Auditorium, and all are welcome. Um, so it's coming up in the list. Teacher turnover is going to be discussed at the next Friday, February, um, next February meeting. Discussion on approval process for one-time spending from revolving accounts will be discussed at the budget subcommittee meeting on February 25th and then brought to the full committee on February 28th. Viking sports parents run will be discussed at the next February meeting and constituent services will be discussed either at the second meeting in March or the second meeting in April or even after town meeting, which that's what I wanted to check with you guys about. When you well, I, I think for um, the run, we need to give them as much time as possible, but it's coming up April 6th. We cannot discuss it today. It is not on the agenda. Mm. Okay. I checked, I checked today. I made we, sure. We, we brought this up last year and said we were going to address it. So I, I would hate to think that we're holding off to, we, you know, to give them even less I time. Can't buy it. I can't, we can't discuss it because it's not on the agenda. We can discuss anything the chairman <clears throat> decides to discuss. If you don't want to, I actually it, that's spoke a with different someone, matter. I spoke with someone from the MASC today, and I was advised if it's not on the agenda, we cannot discuss it. So when will we discuss it? We At the next, next February 28th. On February 28th. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give so, them less than a month to move if they have to. Right, no, well, a little more than a month. A little more than a month. Over a month. Yeah. Over a month. Oh. <clears throat> so I guess I need to find out from you all. Um, Teresa had brought up constituent services, so do you want it at the second meeting in March, the second meeting in April, or after town meeting? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Um, uh, to talk about constituent services or start talking about it, do you want it discussed at the second meeting in March, the second meeting in April, or after town meeting? Well, we do it as soon as we can. What was our concern? Um, Teresa wanted to discuss con have starting constituent services with, uh, with the committee, but um, I have some issues that I wanted to discuss with her f when we, whenever we start discussing it. So um, I just need to find out when you all want to start discussing it. Because what we really need to do, because it's budget season, I know all year is budget season for us, but we have town meeting coming up, um, and we're going to be talking about our budget in, at our budget hearing. and whatever else might come up with, with regard to the budget. So we really need to stay focused on that too. So I don't want to make a big deal out of smaller items when we have the budget that we need to be discussing. Well, the budget is going to be discussed at the presentation and at the budget subcommittee meeting. So I don't see it taking up time in our normal meetings. I would suggest we reach out to Teresa if that was something she wanted to discuss, see which date she'd prefer to do. Okay, I could do that too. But I do like the focus on the budget. Yeah, but we, I mean, so budget's I taken care of in the budget presentation and the budget subcommittee. <coughs> I don't think we have to not address issues during budget season <coughs> simply because it's budget season. We're not 10 year olds, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Okay. But I do think that our focus should be primarily on the budget because nothing else happens without the budget. So. Yeah. That doesn't mean we, we don't look at other things. So. <laughs> so I'll check with Teresa about the constituent service. And next up, we have Superintendent's Corner. Just to the calendar, the NRC update is um, we, just, we sign an MOU with them. Uh, doesn't have any money, doesn't have anything really related except um, getting more social and emotional um, opportunities, uh, hands-on, and some more people clinicians um, for at-risk students and at-risk opportunities for us um, using um, having more of a consortium or having uh, more people in the collaborative be able to get together meet talk about some of the issues that are happening at all the schools um, so we'll have uh, we'll have someone from here um, who can go and talk about what what they're seeing um, with our students, what the at-risk are, and then we could have clinicians come here as well. Um, next year, as you know, we're, uh, that's part of our budget. We'll be bringing in two um, social, work, social worker adjustment co counselors um, at a uh, really um, great rate uh, using the North River Collaborative. These people will come in and help us um, work with our at-risk students. Uh, the clinicians will be here um, uh, working um, 
and uh, the program is at West Bridgewater now, and they, they can't say enough about it. Um, and it's, um, it helps offset the cost of having you know, another full-time uh, school psychologist or adjustment counselor. We're going to go through the collaborative to get that. I actually met one of the Bridgewater students we have who's, I think, in the Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Very impressed by him. Um, and then bumped into a couple parents who had nothing but incredible things to say about him. So that, the I assume, yeah, that's the program we talked Those about last week, right? Interns that are working yeah. under Karen Clifford, but these are similar. They're graduate yeah. students. Um, and the, the reason why we have a partnership with North River Collaborative is because they're supervising and evaluating them, but we're giving them, obviously, the experience to work in the school setting. So. Just it was nice to see that that yeah. setup can work. Yeah, and Karen. It, the, the, these parents raved about yeah. it. Karen's doing a nice job bringing as many interns as she can in here from Bridgewater State. They get a lot of hours with us. But the best part is there's another set of eyes and another set of kid gloves uh, for our students. Um, we seem to have more and more, you know, social emotional. Um, at Reed's, uh, we have tabled the building project. As you know, I told you that we, we were trying to build a new school. Um, right now, uh, they uh, collaboratives under, in the Commonwealth. Um, under Massachusetts general law, do not get, uh, cannot get into the MSBA and or the accelerated repair program. So they don't, they can't offset their costs. So a thirty million dollar building would be a thirty million dollar building, and we, as part of that collaborative, would have to increase um, our membership fee. Um, and we, I'm on that subcommittee. We decided that it would be a little bit too much uh, for each of the. Um, 30 to 28 schools to to put up for 30 million dollars at this time however it's not off the table we're still looking at it we're still um, advocating the legislators for it to see if we could use um, get into the MSBA and try to push the law a little bit but we're also looking for um, building space in other areas um, the executive director dr. Craig does not want to move from Middleborough because it's such a it's a center area um, for, a lot of the pro for a lot of the schools that use the Reeds Collaborative. They have a, um, a very progressive um, and probably the best um, hard of hearing um, schools. A lot, of that, a lot of students go there. Um, and so she does not want to move that because it seems like a really good uh, general area. There are a couple of buildings, old office buildings right now that are for lease over in that area, that general area by for the 495. So she's going to be looking at those buildings to see if a school could be um, put into one of those buildings. They did that for another collaborative, uh, not Charms, but Belco. Is it Belco? Bico. Bico. Bico did that um, a few years ago. They 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 were gonna they wanted to build a new school. They ended up finding a office building. If your office building is sitting there for three four years and no one wants it, and someone comes in and says, yeah, I'll do it, you know, and you know you're gonna get a 10 year or 20 year rental lease agreement, you know, someone's gonna do that with us. So that, I just wanted to let you know that that's off the table at this time for the reads. Uh, CPAC, Dr. Williams and I sat in at a CPAC meeting um, uh, with our, the, the CPAC parents meeting. Um, Ellen uh, came as well because they wanted to see um, the district uh, representation and they also wanted to the school committee. They just want to say that they're here to help. They want to support parents. They want to support kids. They want, they would like to come to a school committee meeting, just talk about what CPAC is, but they want parents to know at home. If you need help, look up on our website. Um, you can find out um, who the president um, of the CPAC parents organization is. It's, um, I think it's under our... Her pupil, our, our um, pupil personnel, special education um, side of the website, um, you can look up and um, ask to speak, you know, send them an email. Um, they are advocates. They really know they have immersed themselves in special education law and they really want to be part of the program. Um, and the winter sports update. You already heard on the vaping tonight, we have the girls uh, down there going for division title. This is a really a neat thing. Uh, the boosters want to thank them. I can't s s say enough about our, our Viking sports uh, the Viking Sports Parents Boosters Club. They, they are really doing a nice job. All the coaches have to do 
send a request to the athletic director. The athletic director brings it to the boosters, and if they need something for the program, uh, for one of the sports, I actually um, asked uh, the athletic director to ask the boosters for, um, they're called, um, they're made by Quick K W I K. Um, they are rain and wind shields, like a bleacher for outside um, uh, on the track or uh, at a game, soccer game, lacrosse game, football game. It's their sort of shelters where the kids can sit underneath um, the players on the field. Um, set up to about 16 people. So, and there'll be one for home and visiting. And there's about 10, they're about six thousand dollars a little less than five uh, five thousand dollars a piece so i want to thank them because when it rains we're still going to play when it snows and it's cold and it's windy we're still going to play but it's nice to have them out there um, and last but not least is unified sports um, if you haven't come to a game and if you can ever make a game if you really want to see um, what sport can do for kids who um, are challenged go to a unified sports. Um, we played basketball a week ago. The parents were there. There were kids there. Um, our team, we have a few kids that go to an out of district placement that are not here, but still are on our team. And when they show up and run out onto the court, they are so excited to be part of the program and to put on a Vikings t-shirt and have their name written on the back of it. It's so important for inclusion. It's something that I am very, uh, I'm gonna advocate for this district. Um, I'm happy that Dr. Uh, Williams is pushing universal design and inclusive practices through instruction. We need these types of opportunities for these kids, for our kids all the time and for their peers and their models that are out on that floor with them. Uh, even Dr. Williams' son uh, was involved with the soccer program it enlightens them, it opens their eyes up to a whole new world that maybe they were in kindergarten together and they didn't realize that they were different at that time. And then 10 years later, they're a little different right now. But when they play a sport, they're all the same. And it's fun and it's healthy and it's good natured and it's about life. And um, you know, I wanna thank Matt uh, Balajran for, for uh, picking up basketball this year. I want to thank the peers that are out there with the kids and the parents that come to watch the kids play. They're just as excited as we are um, and to get out there and watch them. And uh, Mr. Leonard, he loves it. Um, the athletic director, we all love it. Um, and so it's just great to see them. And they will be at our sports awards night. Um, so. That's all I have, and now I know that I see Mrs. Vaughn ready to go this evening. But you can't come until the chair tells you. I can see you over there, out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> I've got to run, I just wanted to let Ms. Barrasso, um, I know you're doing something on the before and after. Um, my wife and I, Molly, we put our daughter in this year. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. All That's an amazing step. I couldn't do it without my Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Enjoy your dinner. Happy Valentine's Day. 3324 at the third. I keep getting text updates from somebody that really loves basketball. He also seems to know what agenda number we're on. Yeah. <laughs> Must be he's 33, he's 34. He is. He's for gloves 33. Rockland. Rockland. Next up, we have Ms. Deb Vaughn, Food Service Director for the School Lunch Program. Welcome. Good I've eaten the food in the cafeterias, and it's pretty tasty. I know. <laughs> pretty. Thank you. I had a nice salad the other day with some tuna fish on top. It was did you, healthy. Did you try the parfait today? No. I'll try lunch again yeah. another day. Yeah. It was a success. Thank you. I do. I, I'm sad when I come Good. and I miss the fish. It's delicious. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So three parts of the program I'd like to discuss tonight. Um, one is on-site review that we had Monday and Tuesday, investing back in the program and our professional development. So um, Monday and Tuesday I was our on-site review um, from Desi. They we have a full two days. We had um, breakfast and lunch they reviewed. Um, 
our staff did an amazing job. Um, we received, um, received a good review. Um, the staff was well trained on offer versus serve and on food safety. What was um, the first thing you said? Huh? What was the first thing you said? Offer versus serve. So we're, we're, a, we're a school <laughs> system that you offer versus serve. In other words, when they go through the serving line, they can pick and choose. So it's oh, not offer food. versus offer serve. Versus you said it so serve. fast. Right. Like, what is she saying? <laughs> so that they don't waste food. So that's what we call it. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So they're very trained in that. And the second part is food safety. Um, two parts that need to be corrected in is the um, one of the menus is um, they I was, was laughing um, our February menu. So they reviewed January and February. So in January on the 15th, there were subgroups that you have to fulfill. So there's greens and there's orange and there's starchies. At the middle school, we offer not just the main meal, but we alt alternate meals. So on the 15th, there was beans, also a salad. Uh, on that subgroup day, we didn't offer a starch. So corrective asking on the starch. Again, on the 31st, there was not a bean. So let's say we're offering salad, that hot dog day, this is you have listen. offered a bean. So. I just like you to know that I had to sit in with the Department of Education why they told me about our corrective action. Right. And at first I thought she was kidding. She said, you didn't offer a starch on Wednesday, right. and then you offered too many yellow vegetables on Thursday. Right. And I went like this. <laughs> okay. And I thought it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and Debbie was like, it's not a stop joke. it. <laughs> right. And I go, what do you mean stop it? It's a joke, right. but it's real. Right. They it's not like we didn't have the vegetables. You have to just have certain color codes Monday through Friday <laughs> to match certain meals. So the analysis was fine. Corrective action was maybe color code your menu. So we're going to do that anyhow. So with that said, that was one of them. Um, next up, she said the um, eligibility letters for our free and reduce um, SNAP letters. Seven digit, they request um, maybe that we um, get proof, an eligibility letter. So we'll do that. But other than that, for the two days that they were here, it went phenomenal. They, they review everything from the wellness policy, from, from finances to inventory, from the staff, professional development. So I think the staff did an amazing job and you know, we're good for another three years. So oh, good. we did good. Well done. Yeah, I think the staff did good. So moving into that, when they leave, they always want to know how you are you're going to invest back into the program. So that's the second part of it. Um, last year, we worked with the central school, and we did a lot there. We did some painting. So this year, we moved on to the middle school. And um, instead of leasing milk coolers, we're actually buying them. So we did that. We purchased them. We also purchased um, two ovens over there as well. And then um, we're out to bid on a new steamer as well for this year. Um, so I think the equipment's doing really well over there, purchased enough over there. And I think the new project is we're going to paint over there this year. So I think we're good. Um, I think they'll be very happy over there at the middle school when we paint. It looks like they're going to need it. Um, <laughs> Let me know if you need my consultation on colors. <laughs> That's right, because you did a great job at the central school. It looks amazing. So, so moving into that. <laughs> is to um, professional development. Um, <laughs> and this year we normally stepped out of the box a little bit and did a live training instead of in-house where they come in and do the training one-to-one. -one. Um, we had a couple chefs come into the high school. The theme was Mediterranean. Um, <laughs> it went really good. It surprised the kids. You know, at first they were like, tzatziki sauce, what's that? But it went really, really good. Tried something different. Um, next up is Latin and uh, what else? Asian fusion, so two different ones. Um, and Deb, you had some students today that said that they liked the orange chicken. That's, that was leading up into our professional development that I brought in um, Maureen Gonzalez from Framingham State University to train my staff into more communication, marketing, um, so they can be more engaged in working with our menu, which brought it into today's um, whole Valentine's um, <laughs> survey, which was very interesting from all three schools. Um, <laughs> the Central School, believe it or not, was one of our top sales today. What, what was it? Top sales. What? 
usually we serve about 150 kids. It was 228 today, which was amazing. Um, well, it's Valentine's Day. Let's a warm heart, it was a warm heart, full stomach. <laughs> it was the parfaits. And then I have to do give a shout out to the middle school for the monitors. They did an amazing job today. I mean, we had the Just today, box Deb. there. And there were 230, 200, we lost count at 250. All these kids are putting in all the surveys. I mean, it was amazing how much work they did over there. So it was a good job. I mean, of course, the top things was pizza, McDonald's, Wendy's, Taco, Taco Bell. Uh, good choice. <laughs> yep. I, I, and Gordon. That was the biggest thing at the high school. Taco. And Gordon, Taco Bell, T-A-C-O-W. Yep. Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Um, some of the other things were amazing. They wanted sushi. We love that. Um, I said bring it to the middle Gordon. school. Middle school wanted sushi. <laughs> Fried octopus. I mean, some of the things were crazy. Overall, <laughs> it was amazing. It really was. So the survey was really, really good. I think the program started well. I've got great staff. Um, I couldn't love any of them. Um, my door is always open, emails. Um, we try to accommodate the kids as best we can. Um, if parents need something, we ask that they email us and we will do the best we can. So. Hey Deb, how do you, from your perspective, and you reflect back on the year, the program, whatever, what, what are you looking for that you would say, okay, you feel good about the program, this is successful? What are the key attributes that you, you, you look for yourself? Um, I would have to say um, the people that I work with, my staff, the people, the, the people that are above me, the people that lead me, you, you can't be where you are today without the people around you. Um, I know when I go to other conference, conferences, they're always struggling because of their administration. You can't move without your administration, and that has been a key thing for me. I'm able to do what I can from my administration. They allow me to move, and if you can't move, your program doesn't move. So that's been the biggest thing for me. Great. Thank you very much. And you make a really good tuna fish sandwich. And that's so. <laughs> she always feeds us well. Yes, she does feed us well. <laughs> and I don't know uh, who's paying for this caviar, though, tonight, but I see caviar over there. Hey, don't think. <laughs> <laughs> no, what was it? Over there. It's the olive topping. Oh, yeah. It looks like, it looks like caviar. <laughs> Thank you very much. Deb, you, can Deb. you just... Great job. Deb, uh, I don't know, September or October, it was brought up that uh, when we changed from, because uh, we had some kids that were buying snacks before their lunch, we changed that on the lines. Okay. Correct? Negative emails, yep, and the balances. Yeah. So we're currently at $4,000, and so we've changed the policy. Before it was a cap, it was $10, so now there's no cap on it anymore. Um, the kids sort of kind of figured out that, hey, we can charge lunch and we can bring cash in and <laughs> still buy snacks. So that's what was happening. Never in the past could you ever charge snacks. So I think there was a misconception of like, oh, the, the, the negative balances was from the snacks. It's never been that way. It's always from charging meals. So the balance is getting higher and higher. It's never been like that. We always, at the end of the year, we always had maybe a $2,000 balance, but we're, we're midstream and we're at $4,000. So, you know, I know you have discussed before that there's no snacks, there's no water, there's no second meals. We're up to 4,500 now. So it's still climbing. And we had the assistant principals call homes, call parents. Right. Um, you know, we, we really don't want to get to that next level of having a letter sent from my office, right. and then if it doesn't get cleared up, then it would go to the town. Um, we have talked about it. Uh, John and I are in discussion with Debbie how to tackle this and how we'll do it at the end of the school year. Just, <clears throat> excuse me, for the record, the My School Bucks app is fantastic because I get to monitor my kids' purchases. <laughs> my kid is rotten. He was, he yeah. was. <laughs> He wants Doritos five days a week, right. and that's what he was doing. We right. didn't realize it until I got the My School Bucks app. Right. And then I started watching him, and I said, you get to do this one time per week, right. you know, and that's it. Right. And then once he realized that I knew what he was doing, 
he said, oh, okay, well, right. it wasn't worth the fight anymore. Right. So he does it one time per week, but you get to monitor it. Their whole grain. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Right. But if, if some, a parent calls, then we can put something on their account that says only one pa you know, snack or you yeah. know, twice a week. I mean, we can do that here at the office, too. Yeah. It, I, I don't even think it's about that. I think what happens is that these kids that buy the snacks, they just want, you know what I mean? They want the snacks and they charge it and they have the money at the high school level. I mean, it's not controlled. Yeah, mine's in third grade. Right. So, so at the high school level, they have. Not much, much longer. Right. They have their own <laughs> money and they're grade. getting the snacks and they just, they know how to do it because the machines are out in the calf. So yeah. it's different. It's not like they're going through the line and they can't purchase yeah. them there. They can say, oh, I forgot my money. I'm going to go charge a lunch and then the snack machine's over there so they can go get the snacks over there. <laughs> so that's how it is at the high school. So this they. We have a young entrepreneur <laughs> class. They're entrepreneurs. They're thinking. Exactly. They're thinking. So, because we have to always provide a meal. So it's that catch-22, what you're going to do there. So. We also know that if parents, uh, Debbie's been very good at this, that if parents have lost their job throughout the year or, or, or felt embarrassed to fill out paperwork in any way, shape, or form, we, just, we, we encourage them, encourage everyone, um, to call uh, Deb Vaughn's office. You'll hear from Melanie Lanny. They'll, they'll send it to you in the mail if you just send it back. You don't have to come in. You, there's no, it doesn't come up. Denied. You know, when I was a long time ago, uh, when the kids put their numbers in, you, they probably didn't do it at Central, but as a high school principal, kid would put a number in and it would say, denied. Right. Or free and reduced. You're free. You know, the kid would remember, Deb, you've been around. They put, they, they put, <laughs> they would push enter and it would say free or reduced. We got rid of that stigma, but there isn't any of that anymore. And uh, if, if any parent needs to call us, just call. There's, there's help available. We're just going to support it. Right. Just let us know what the, what the issue is. And, and Deb can handle that. Right. And it's not a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Nope. It's a lunch. It's a full It's meal. a full lunch. Yeah. Everybody gets We decided that a long meal. time ago. Good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not peanut butter and fluff. We're peanut free. Not peanut butter. We're peanut free. <laughs> oh, that's right. It's not. Right. <laughs> it's Sorry about butter. that. Peanut free. It's sun butter. <laughs> Maybe um, you know. on, a, on a go forward basis, Deb, you could put up uh, instructions how to properly spell taco would help me a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, it's across the board. You've got two schools on that. Wow. It's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're Thank you, Deb. You're welcome. Next up, we have Lisa Varasso, Pre-K to 6 Student Activities Director, and um, she's going to be discussing the before and after care program. Welcome. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Um, okay, so um, uh, you would want me just to discuss, um, so I kind of wrote everything down, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to interrupt me, or um, I'll be happy to answer any questions after the fact. Um, so, for anybody that's unaware, I came into this position um, on September 1st, 2017. Okay, so um, we currently have 291 students enrolled in our before and after care program. That is up significantly from last year. Um, the grades range from pre-K through grade eight. Um, we do currently have seven students that come over. They take the bus over. Um, so they're in seventh and eighth grade. Um, they take the bus over um, to the middle school, and that's where they're based. Um, after care only, obviously not before care. Um, I currently have 32 staff members working the before and after care program. Uh, the ratio at the present time is on average of one adult to 10 children. Uh, most days it's basically one adult to eight to nine children. Um, we are revolving account, and our pricing is as follows. Um, for my pre-K to grade two students, we are $8 per day for our morning session, which breaks down to $4 an hour. Uh, we're $10 per day for our PM session, which is a breakdown of $3.07 per, um, uh, per session, um, per hour, I'm sorry. Um, and we're $19 for half days, which is um, $3.04 per hour. Um, my grades um, through the six. We are $7 per day for our AM session, um, which is $5.18 an hour, $11 per day for uh, my PM session, 
um, which is $3.14 an hour, and we are $21 for the half day, um, which is $3.23 an hour. Um, let's see. The hours for the half day, well, for example, is 6.45. Oh, our hours that were open at 6.45 a.m. Um, until 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, at a request of several working parents, um, we were opening at 7 o'clock. Um, that was not working for some of the parents, so we did open it this year to 6.45 a.m. for those parents. Um, now, snacks for all students in the aftercare program are included in the price that I just mentioned, the $3 range. Um, children are allowed one healthy snack a day, which is basically cheese sticks, fresh fruit, yogurt, dull diced fruit, um, baby carrots, for an example. Um, they're also allowed what we call like a not so healthy snack, <laughs> um, such as pirate booties, low sugar cereal, any of the cereal that I do order is all low sugar. Um, <clears throat> let's see, um, pudding, baked chips, Cheez-Its, Rice Krispie treats, um, things like that. Um, we, they're allowed one juice a day. Um, we don't want anyone going home on sugar highs. Um, and they're also allowed unlimited water and milk. Um, okay, so um, the reason that, um, I know there were questions about the before and after care breakfast. Um, the reason why we had to discontinue the um, before and after care breakfast, um, we, it was moved under the umbrella of the National School Lunch Program, um, and it was to ensure that all policies and procedures are being met. Um, unfortunately, the before and after care program did not have the resources to be compliant for food safety. Um, basically saying when it was done, um, when it was served before, it just wasn't in compliant and it wasn't as safe as it should have been for the kids. So um, that's why it moved over to this. Um, we offer services for school breaks, PDD days, and summer breaks at a cost of $44 a day. This charge is for the hours of 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. With this is breakfast and two snacks, a morning snack and an afternoon snack, and unlimited beverages of water or milk throughout the day. Again, one juice. Um, if a child is like super hungry during the day, we never turn them down for another snack. If they want another snack, we lead them towards the healthy snack. So if say they need a third snack during the day, we do have some kids that have low blood sugar or they'll start to get a little tired or grumpy or something like that. We know they need a snack. We will gear them towards a, a healthy snack if that's the case. Um, these prices, none of these prices have increased since coming into my position and I have absolutely no plans to increase it next year. So included also in that $44 pricing, um, we offer numerous field trips, pizza parties, ice cream Sunday parties, entertainment brought into the school, and many arts and crafts and themed parties that we think students will enjoy. Um, for example, February vacation, Monday is a holiday, Tuesday we're doing an ice cream Sunday party, um, who can make the most wildest ice cream Sunday? Um, that's Tuesday, Wednesday, we are doing, oh, arts and crafts day, um, I just bought brand new arts and crafts for the kids they could do, all winter themed. Um, I bought the weaving looms. Remember the pot holders that we all used to make when we were little? Mm -hmm. We're bringing that back. I'm really huge <laughs> into bringing back yeah. uh, because that's what they seem to love. Um, <laughs> Thursday, we are going to the East Bridgewater Cinema. Um, we're going to go see Lego 2, and um, each child will be provided with a kitty pack, which is popcorn, gummy bears, the right gummy bears, which you were saying about, <laughs> yeah. um, and a drink. Um, and my staff to student ratio for that is I have five staff members going with 16 kids. You may have six going. <laughs> you have gummy bears. Uh, um, is that Wednesday? Uh, oh, that's, I'm sorry, that, so Wednesday, so no, Tuesday is the ice cream Sunday day, Wednesday is day. the arts and crafts day, <laughs> Thursday is the movie, and Friday is um, pizza day, so I emailed all the parents of the kids that are coming Friday, said send me your what your, favorite, your child's favorite pizza is. Um, pretty much pepperoni is the big one right now, um, cheese and everything, and then um, we'll be doing a big pizza party. I probably ending at, yeah. <laughs> so this is all included in the $44 with the breakfast, the two snacks, the three if they need it, and seven to six. So it's Taco Bell $4. was there, it was very high on that category. We should that will not be served in my program, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, their parents can take them. Just let us a tomato on <laughs> those tacos. Um, oh. Yeah, I was just yeah, exactly, but not from Taco Bell. Don't worry, um, Gordon. Listen, I have, uh, my middle son is addicted to Taco Bell, so I am not saying, but I'm just not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> from the minute they walk through the door until the minute they leave, I want them to feel that the before and after care is not a place where they have to go, 
but a place where they want to go. Um, I'm very proud when I say this year that I've had several families sign their children up for my program for the, simply social. They're there not because they have to be, their parents want them to be there for the social, and I'm really proud of that. And a big kudos to my staff because I have staff that are seniors here, and I have staff that are in their 70s, and they're all ranges, and um, I have everything from nurturing to um, the boys that look at the girls and they're like, oh, and the funny one is the college boys that the girls look at that and I'm like, oh, I want to be you or I want to date you. It's, it's hilarious. So <laughs> my staff just hands down are just unbelievable. Um, so let's see. Um, all field trips and programs that happen in the before and after care since me taking over are 100% paid, uh, um, paid for by the before and after care revolving account. I do not and do not plan to change this in the near future at all. I, I believe if a parent has to work, such as I did, um, they feel guilty enough leaving their children over like a February vacation or over the summer and things like that. The least I can do is not make them feel guilty and let these kids have fun and not sit in a room and stare at each other all day. So that's moving forward. I have no, no, I'm not going to change it. Um, on a typical Monday through Friday week, uh, students get to participate in programs such as Drums Alive. If you have not seen Drums Alive, you honestly should step into my aftercare program someday. Laura Lipinski teaches it. I'm not sure if you are familiar with her. She is amazing with the kids. I just put some um, pictures up on Facebook and Instagram. Um, you can check out the pictures or you can go watch the kids. The preschoolers are going crazy over it. Um, Central school is just going nuts. I have to actually add a second day. Um, Art with Mr. Charland, my Mitchell kids love um, being pulled from the aftercare. They don't have to go. It's whoever wants to, and he's always doing a different creation with the kids every um, Wednesday. He takes whoever wants to go. Um, karaoke, um, Mrs. Kelm is famous for um, <laughs> doing the karaoke, and the kids just, they think it's the best thing in the world. Um, this is all on just what goes on and on an average week. On a daily basis, the kids have new movies, games, puzzles, sports equi equipment such as soccer balls, croquet, which is their absolute favorite. They're already asking when they can go out and play croquet again. We've gone through two sets. They just can't get enough of it. <laughs> Ladder ball, snowshoes, sleds, bowling, and they have plenty of arts and crafts. Um, the children have the option to learn crocheting. Um, Mrs. McNeil at the Mitchell School, um, she's a whiz at crocheting, and she's got a table of kids all the time. They're just, she's teaching them how to crochet. They make scarves, they make necklaces, they make everything. Um, if they want to paint nails, we have some people that, you know, they love to paint nails, so they have their nails decorated. Um, they participate in our famous bingo tournaments, so they all get prizes for the bingo tournaments. Um, and it's just a few of the activities that we do on a daily basis, the before and after care program. So um, that's where everything kind of stands right now. Um, if anybody has any questions. I think it sounds great. I'm curious. So like um, Deb Vaughn had said, she has an outstanding balance for food services. Do you have an outstanding balance for? I do. Um, so right now, um, I have $6,400 in outstanding balances. Um, I have tried to collect them. I did meet with Mr. Shea um, last week. Uh, Mr. Shea has now taken over those collections. Uh, letters have gone out. Um, and if he's given, I think, another letter, maybe going out this week, and then they'll be turned over to the town. But for the most part, um, it's pretty good. When I came in, it was a pretty big debt. So it's higher than 64. Higher than that? Oh, without, yeah. Wow. Without, oh, a lot. So, um, but, yeah. So. Lisa, can you touch on Little Vikings real quick, <coughs> the, what you've got coming oh, up? Now you're going to see my face light up. Just, um, to, just, ju so just little, quick. Yep, very quick. Little Vikings. That's this the is summer fifth, program, yep. right? Little Vikings is our five week, um, and this is our fifth year, being a year program. I really kind of don't want to give away too much about it no, right just now. That um, what do you want to know about it? That your, your, your program's coming out soon, right? Um, yep. I was with um, Rose from Happy Frog Friday. Um, we designed, we put the whole program together. Um, she will be coming back to me with a proof. She's amazing at taking my vision. Um, so I should be hoping to get a proof from her within the next probably week or so. Um, catalogs are slated um, to be going out the week of March 18th, if the proof and everything goes OK. Um, there's a lot of surprises in store fifth year. We have a big entertainment the last day. Um, we have a huge grand prize that we're doing for every week your child comes to Little Vikings. Their name is going to, um, they're going to fill out a little ticket and there's going to be a big grand prize at the end, but I really want to save that. Um, if, if you guys don't mind, if you want me to come back 
after the cattle explode, I'm oh, always yeah. happy to go out. But it's just something that I really want the kids to see and know. Um, I want to see the excitement for them. Um, great. Forest. That's it, that's like my baby. So that's great. So you'll come back in the spring. To tell uh, us. Yeah, uh, I usually will come back anyways for the sponsors and stuff like that. But if anybody has any questions about Little Vikings, um, but it's a big year and it's Thanks. great. A huge fan. Both my kids go to. Oh, the Little thank Vikings. you. We absolutely thank you. This one has been a, a year in the making, so I'm super. It's got my daughter into pre-K. Oh, like the, oh the, yeah. The, the, yep. the, the transition yep. period that, yeah. that got her there. Good. I'm um, happy to hear that. And I loved everything you said. I just had one question sure. about. Um, uh, we talked about something about being unsafe early on in the in the conversation. Um, so I th yes. And I was just hoping that you could expand a well, little bit. Well, I I'd say it might have been a wrong word for <coughs> say because I can't. I was not here when it. So the person that was here prior to me, the food was brought in. So like that person would go to whatever a Costco or a BJ's or something like that. So say food temperature. Yep. You know what I mean? So, like, it, it wasn't regulated. Here, everything is regulated by the state. It's safe. It's at code. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, you can't just, um, you just can't throw out, like, a dozen donuts and say, here, go, here's your <laughs> breakfast. You know what I mean? Like, this is all regulated by the state, where before, it wasn't regulated. Yep. You know what I mean? It was like, okay, whatever they were in the mood to buy. Okay, here's waffles with butter and syrup. And, you know what I mean? It, it, the, the intention was there. But that you know what I mean. It wasn't regulated the way it's regulated. So this now is regulated now by Desi, or is it the uh, Deb's uh, program? Deb's program. Yeah, okay. Deb's program. <clears throat> it's regulated by, and, it, and it's it's healthier for the kids. Yep. So even if the kids are getting, um, sure. I just hear that word in my. Yeah, it was probably a wrong word, for me, and I wasn't here at the time. So it was, put it this way: when when I'm the only one that can transport if I need to, and I think in the year and a half I've been here, I've transported a case of chips like once yep. but when you're transporting food and you, oh I might have to stop here or I have to go you don't know the temperature of somebody's car or you yep. don't know like you know what I mean so it's not that it was a bad thing it just it wasn't regulated and it, it's it's more safe for the children to have it regulated so we're, so we're tracking it better now oh it's, it's yeah so everything comes from food service everything comes from food so every breakfast that is being served is is mandated by the state like i we cannot put anything out if it's not state approved right. okay so if, if they want to put out um even like my in the afternoon like i can order like the, like the little packs the kids like the little pack of the donuts or something mm -hmm. like that they're whole wheat they're not like the donuts that you can go buy at like 7-eleven yep. off the shelf they, they're all regulated okay. things so yeah rob also under the previous directorship expiration date weren't being paid attention to so there was a lot of waste that was happening because yeah. uh, the circulation of storage wasn't being done I mean certainly they didn't have the food service qualifications that the food service department in the district does so yeah. you know we put the expertise in the hands of the people who specialize in it right um, and so it allows so Lisa safe, right, right. So, yeah mm -hmm. and it allows Lisa and her team to be able to focus on their expertise and, and that's working with the children and, and Deb can oversee um, making sure that they have the food items that they need and um, they're at the quantities they need and they, they fulfill all the regulations uh, and we're not finding that we have a lot of waste. Mm -hmm. So even when I order my snacks for the kids, my snacks go to Deb and then Deb and I, like if, if we, I have any questions or she has any questions, we, we're total in collaboration as far as even my snacks. We make sure those snacks are all regulated. Yeah. <clears throat> I've just seen a lot of this through the Boys and Girls Club, my work with the Boys and Girls Club, um, and I just I know how stringent those those rules and regulations are. Uh, so I think it's great that if we're operating under that guideline, then I'm yeah. perfectly happy. Yep. Yeah, we have, we're not going to change that. That's here to stay. Okay. Absolutely guaranteed. So, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Next up, we have um, Jennifer McParland and Deb Dupre to speak about 1A curriculum and 1B instruction. Goes along with our strategic plan, 1A and B. Jenna, you But it's going up. Good evening. Hi, Good evening. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having us tonight. Thanks for being here. And happy Valentine's Day, everyone. <laughs> Um, so Mrs. McPartland and I are going to give you a brief update on curriculum and instruction based on our strategic plan. And we're just going to highlight some of the things that we've done up to this point. This is essentially the mid-year piece of the school year. 
And so we're going to just tell you what we've been doing at the schools, at the various schools, starting with a curriculum update at Central School. So Jen? At Central School right now, they're in the midst of doing their action planning for their grade level writing. By the end of the year, their plan is to have three different writing prompts uh, per term, per grade level, that are common amongst their grade level so that they can start to look at trends in student writing and progression of student writing. Uh, they have also increased their collaboration time amongst their grade levels. They used to meet, um, be able to meet monthly as a grade level, and now they have increased that to being able to find time to, we meet, to meet weekly um, to collaborate on all types of curriculum. And Mrs. Byrne has also added breakout sessions to her staff meetings so that they can share instructional practices um, and model for each other and be able to collaborate in another setting. Great. And now I'll just mention a little bit about the Mitchell School. As you know, we focus quite a bit on writing. So the second term, we focus really on the conferencing part of writing and how to effectively administer conferences with students around their writing products. So we've looked at some research. We've talked about how to give verbal feedback to kids and also written feedback. And we're trying to evaluate the effectiveness of that. So some teachers approach it a little bit differently. So we're looking at what the research says and how effective it is in terms of their first draft to their final draft and really consolidating what makes a difference. So for the next term, we heard that one of the variables that might make a difference is the actual writing prompt that we administer. So if every grade level is doing a different writing prompt, it's really difficult to compare across the grade levels how much their writing is improved according to the state standards. So we decided for term three, um, between myself and Mr. Gentile and Mrs. McPartland, we've had a lot of meetings about writing, to try a prompt that the entire school can do at the Mitchell School. And we are, we're going to talk about friendship and what is a good friend and describing characteristics. And then what we do is during PLCs, we meet with the staff and we look at student writing samples and we talk about how effective their writing is and looking at across the board at all the grade levels and comparing the details and looking at topic sentences. And I think it will really help us evaluate more effectively the students' writing and how much they've progressed. So we're looking forward to that. We've also promoted writing within the special areas. So at first, it's like, wow, writing in phys ed? How is that going to work? But we've really found some creative ways in which to do that. Kids are explaining how to play bowling after a bowling unit. I was in a class the other day for computers where they were actually writing in a tech journal about what topics they found difficult during the semester and what they need more instruction in. So seeing writing in all the special areas has been really rewarding. And again, we're going to come together as a staff and talk about how that went and what other topics we can write about that's really engaging for the kids. I know in one of the computer classes, they wrote about um, Fortnite and Minecraft, and they love those games. So they were so engaged and enthralled in, in their writing activity, which is what we want to see. We've also focused on fit money training, and that program has to do with financial literacy. And last year, we piloted that program in grades four and five. Now we're doing it in three, four, five, and six. Our teachers have been trained in it. They actually went through a whole day training on January 11th, and now they're ready to implement the lessons for the first time, some of our grade levels. They've decided this year to implement them after MCAS is over, and they're going to try them out, test them out. But as we're looking at Ready Math, which is our new math program, they're really looking at where can these lessons fit in appropriately in the new math curriculum. What's exciting is it really talks about things like credit, debit, insurance, things that kids maybe don't have a lot of information about. Like with a credit card, a lot of our younger kids, you have third grade students, may not even understand that eventually you have to pay that off. <laughs> it's not like, wow, I can just pass this through and I don't have to pay for it. So just topics like that are going to be so important for the financial literacy of our students. I wish they had something like that when I was in school as well. I think it's very valuable, real world skills. Then we're also going to focus on, I know Dr. Williams probably coming up in the future, we'll talk a little bit more about UDL and the UDL Academy that a lot of the staff has been attending. So um, universal design for learning really focuses on choices and options and removing barriers for students. So we're really looking at the Mitchell School at how can we offer more opportunities for kids to present different ways to demonstrate learning. So for example, if they're learning fractions in math, rather than taking just a written test, 
Maybe a kid can do a poster. Maybe a child can do some Google Slides. Maybe kids can demonstrate their understanding of fractions through a writing piece. So really looking at choice boards and giving kids options. And as an evaluator, I have been really heightened in all the classrooms that I've been going into and really paying attention to are we offering choices to our students and what kinds of choices are we giving kids in order to demonstrate their learning. Because everyone learns differently and they can demonstrate their knowledge in different ways. And then the last thing I just want to mention here is it's been so exciting to see the cross-building collaboration. I know since the superintendent has come on board, she has really talked about unifying the district as one. So the other day, uh, we had an opportunity with a high school teacher, Mr. Silver, um, and Ms. Principe, who is a teacher in fourth grade in my building, and they were collaborating about some of the science topics that they teach and decided to do a project where the high school students in science were doing videos on plate tectonics and they were talking about divergent plates and convergent plates and they actually demonstrated it with graham crackers so that the children could understand and then Ms. Principe students watched the videos and they actually evaluated the high school students videos and they were so excited they were like wow we get to grade high school yeah. students that's <laughs> awesome um, so just to see that collaboration going on, and I know Mr. Gentile and myself are really trying to promote that, and with the help of Mrs. McPartland as our curriculum coordinator, looking at what everyone is doing and how we can bring it all together as a unified system has been very exciting. All right, at the high school right now, they are um, knee deep in curriculum mapping. That's something that they have undertaken this year, and so over the course of the year, they are looking at essential questions, making sure that their planning is objective driven, student centered classrooms, a lot of these, you know, student choice, uh, a lot of more classrooms where teachers are more of a facilitator rather than just a director of the learning. So we, um, as the high school group gets together, they're going to be looking on student engagement, making sure that, you know, high school students sometimes can be hard to hook. So they're going to be looking at ways to engage students into their learning. And um, Mr. Duffy, in speaking with him, he wanted to give a shout out about the integration of tech tools at the high school as a thanks to Aaron Fisher. All right. Um, as for MAP, this, is, uh, this was a perfect time to have a meeting right now because our winter testing closed on uh, February 1st. So this is the, probably the most informative time for our teachers because it allows them to check in mid-year, see where the students are at, what adjustments need to be made. Um, our district goal right now is about student growth because if students are growing, then they are achieving. The achievement also is ultimately impacted. So at the Central School, uh, Mrs. Byrne and the Reading Specialists are having individual meetings with teachers because they can look at their map data, they can look at their devil's literacy data, their math and reading assessments because they have those self-contained classrooms. So they're able to then take that information and then collaboratively make a plan moving forward. What needs to be adjusted? What students should we be you know, targeting? How can we challenge other students? So those um, meetings, I believe, just probably finished up because I know they were taking place right after testing finished. At Mitchell School? Great. And at the Mitchell School, again, we're very fortunate to have Mrs. McPartland on board with us and Mrs. Fisher as we rotate through doing PLCs with our teachers, really educating them about MAP data, the MAP program, and all of our technology tools that are available. We focused this past week on PLCs with MAP growth, as Mrs. McPartland has said, and just having teachers look at the data and looking at ways that we, we can improve. And one of the things that we had talked about now that teachers have become more familiar with all the different reports that are available, because initially it can be overwhelming. There's a lot of information there. Um, Mrs. McPartland has helped us really hone in on what is valuable to really direct instruction and where we can focus on different skills and topics with kids that are ready for, to learn. And now we're starting to have our teachers feel very comfortable with having conferences and meetings with individual students. So I know it started with one of our sixth grade teachers who reached out and said, I really want to tell these students how they're doing. I want my kids to know. I want them to see their growth from fall to winter and where they need to go in the spring and set some goals on how to get there. Now, I know Mrs. McPartland with this sixth grade teacher had modeled how to do that and they had worked together. And now it's kind of spread like wildfire. All these teachers want to do this. They want to tell their kids about the data. And they were very honest in their meetings. Some of the kids would say things like, 
oh, I know I rushed through and I know that MAP wants me to get here. I think I could take my time a little bit more. Or maybe I need to really read the questions very carefully and focus on what they're asking me to do. So just having kids be reflective about how they can improve. And it also puts the onus back on them to set some goals and to say that map data is important and we're looking at this and this is something that you need to do your best and try your best on because it's going to drive our instruction as we move forward. The junior senior high school is also having similar conversations with their students about setting goals for themselves. Uh, they were having a little bit of difficulty getting the students engaged and really taking it seriously. And so uh, seventh and eighth grade actually decided that they were going to have a competition uh, by homeroom and it was based completely on student growth. Not so much on who can get the highest score. Or the ch we don't talk about that. We talk about individual growth. Because the best thing about MAP is that you are only compared to kids like yourself. MAP will make a projection and say, we hope you can grow by this much because other kids like you tend to grow that much. So they took homerooms, which were mixes of kids, and they had a competition. And at the end, the winning homerooms, uh, one grade level did a pizza party, and the other grade level did a breakfast. So and the growth was through the roof. So we're hoping to continue that momentum. And also, they're having these conversations now with students to say, this is really important. Not only does it inform the teachers, but it gives them something to strive for. Um, at the department level, at the, um, especially like, you know, the math department and the ELA department, you have multiple teachers sometimes teaching the same um, course. So this is great for collaborative conversations where you might have three or four teachers who are all teaching Algebra 2. Well, we can look at all the growth in those classrooms and they can really collaborate and say, what are you doing to get that growth? Or what could I change in my practice? Or what do we need to change in, with our materials and our assessments? So it's allowing for those types of conversations to happen at the upper levels as well. When will the MAP um, data become available for people to see? The MAP data we send home at the end of every, um, at the end of every year. It goes home with the, with the uh, report card. So it's not yeah. like... Um, we won't see it during parent-teacher conferences. You can that. ask for it. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yep, yep, you can ask to see it during that, yep. The mid-year point is um, especially, um, is, is mainly for teachers because that's what's going to inform their instruction for the rest of the year, but the data is available. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, and finally, uh, we have this, our curriculum review cycle, which is our six-year cycle. Right now, we are in that wellness, social, emotional learning, and we are currently looking at all of the curriculums. Um, it's a really complex uh, topic to look at because you have health, physical education, you have um, the guidance department, you have um, a lot of people involved in this topic. Uh, so we're looking at streamlining the curriculum. What do we have already for materials? What do we have? What type of instruction do we have going on at the different grade levels? And also, what community resources are we uh, tapping into, and where do they fit into the different parts of the of the program? Uh, luckily, we have two staff members who applied to be on the Comprehensive Health Framework Review Panel and were accepted. So we have um, Michelle Amrault, who's a health teacher at Central School, and Sarah Moore, who's a guidance counselor here at the Junior Senior. And as being members of this framework review panel, they are offering their input into the new frameworks, which haven't been revised for 20 years. So you can imagine the changes that have taken place just hearing that, you know, even the vaping conversation earlier, the changes that need to take place within that framework. It hadn't been revised since 99. So they right now are part of a panel. I think they met, <clears throat> met two or three times already with the state, and they have meetings throughout um, the spring and then gives them firsthand insight into the new frameworks, which um, look, look like they'll be out for public comment um, over the summer. And so that is really helping to drive our work here in combining all of these frameworks together. Um, for our, oh, you wanted to mention something about safety care too. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that we subscribe to safety care, which is really a program where about 60 of our staff members currently are trained. And we have trainers in the district as well. I'm one of the trainers. And really what it is is a behavioral program that focuses on proactive approaches on how to teach pro-social behaviors to students. And it really works on de-escalating students if they're starting to demonstrate aggression or any kind of challenging or dangerous behavior. And it really focuses on replacing those behaviors with something that is more productive. So it's been a, a quality program Again, we're looking at training those teachers that need to be trained or teaching assistants, and they have implemented a lot of strategies on a daily basis, which has really prevented a lot of crises from happening when a child is maybe frustrated or agitated. 
So it really talks about what we can do as professionals to even control our own actions and interactions with children. All right, and just a peek for next year, uh, the review for next year will be history and social science. The framework was voted on last July, so it is in effect right now. And we are looking at already where are the shifts in the content, what, what things are moving from one grade level to another, and our teachers are already having those cross-grade and cross-building conversations. Um, as part of that, too, is that we're going to be on the hunt. It's also one of those frameworks that has not been revised in however many years. So we will, I've already got conversations going with uh, multiple vendors about uh, resources that are going to be coming available to align to the new curriculum and what's going to be out there. So, um, and Desi has also offered some info sessions around the state. I attended one a few months ago, and then members from this building and Mitchell School also have gone so they can start to hear the shifts. One of my biggest takeaways from that was that our students are no longer going to be heavily focused on memorization and what facts can you spit back. It's going to be more about what can you do with them. So everything is going to be about application. So no, it's not going to be a identify on a map or um, you know tell me the dates of this. It's more going to be about looking at big picture items. So it's going to be a shift not only in the topics that are taught in our different grade levels, but also in the way we teach things. So that's going to be part of the review process next year, and that's why we're already kind of dabbling in it right now. Hmm. So. What about with the state? The um, they were going to come out and say that. We for whatever grade they had to do a civics project so that might be part of this new yep it's part of the new one they're saying there is going to be a civics project um i i haven't gotten the clarification on whether or not um being a junior senior high school if you have to have one in seventh and eighth grade and one at the high school level or if because we're one building it would be one but there is going to be a civics project requirement um for graduating yep. well, that might not come out till i know they they talked about it i thought that they had Jesse uh, had decided upon something, but at the de when I was at the uh, info session, they skirted around the topic a little bit. Yeah, everybody wanted to know, but they squared. They they uh, didn't quite answer that question, and they didn't quite answer the question about whether there's going to be an assessment. They did that or what it would look like. They did that at conference too. They kind of just yeah you know, didn't really answer the. question. They made it sound like there would be some sort of assessment <coughs> because there is somebody dedicated to the assessment development process for for history and social science, but they did mention that it, it's not necessarily going to be super content-based. It's not going to be the type of, you know, like I said, you're recalling facts or, or dates. It's going to be more about, let's say, taking a document and analyzing a document. Are you able to analyze a primary source? It's going to be really about your application of skills to something that you're given, something that you would actually be doing in real life later on. So, but they have not, they will not say yet what that's going to look like. So. Thank you. To be to be continued. To be continued. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thank you. That was Thank very you. informative. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Switch over there. And next, next up we have Aaron Fisher. Next, <laughs> next up we have Erin Fisher. She's going to talk to us about technology, and this uh, corresponds with strategic plan number four. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so just a quick update on technology. Um, in both central and middle school, uh, once a month, I meet with the staff and we have a professional learning community and I usually align it. I follow up um, after Mrs. McPartland and try to align with what she's doing. So if it's writing, then I look at tools with the staff um, that can be geared towards writing. If it's on uh, diversity of assessment, we look at different tools that we can use with assessment. Um, and these have been very highly received. Um, they look a little different between the buildings based on the population, um, but it's, you, it's very, um, it's my favorite meeting of the month aside from one other committee I'm on. Uh, oh, it's besides PD Academy. <laughs> it's, I, uh, I really love the PLCs that we do and um, it, it's just a great, a great time. Um, at the junior senior high school, uh, because of the scheduling, it's a little more difficult for me to do those because they don't all have a common, um, they don't have as often a common planning time. So Mr. Duffy and myself have spoken and I'm going to start attending their staff meetings and presenting a quick tech tool during their staff meetings and then following up later in the month during their CPT time, but only briefly because they're using that time to work on um, curriculum. So that's 
going to happen there. And then I also have plenty of teacher appointments. My calendar is available, and teachers regularly sign, sign up with me. And sometimes it's uh, during their planning time to give them different uh, professional development. And other times it's during class time, and I'm in with students in facilitating the lesson with the technology. So I'm in both of those roles. And then um, I've also, this past month, been heavily working on our professional development day, which is our technology PD day that's coming up. So our annual technology PD day, which is the Monday following February vacation, this is like my baby. Um, we have 38 workshops being offered and 30 of our own staff presenting. This is like a record number of our own staff presenting. I cannot wait. Watch us on Twitter. I'm going to encourage everyone to tweet it. Um, we have some amazing staff members that I'm like over the moon proud of. They text me all the time, and um, they're even being sought out now by other schools to come present um, at other school districts. So it's they're just the teachers here are doing such a great job embracing technology and and pushing it out to our staff. We have six outside presenters, um, friends of mine that. Um, tech directors from other schools, tech integrators from other schools that we kind of do each other a favor and they'll come here and present a workshop and I might present a workshop for them and they're very knowledgeable as well. Uh, and you can see our workshops that are being offered. We have, uh, that's only just a small smattering of our options there, but um, we have choice boards and Google applications and makerspace activities, iPads in the classroom, assistive technology, hyperdocs, infographics, harnessing social media, overcoming barriers to learning, Thinking outside the docs, I love that one. Um, so we have a lot of, and none of those are mine. Those are all the other staff members. So they're really well versed in the technology, and that's through some. Some of it's through working with me, and some of it's what they take on with their own initiatives. Um, and this day has been such a success. This is, I believe, our fourth or fifth year with this day um, that I'm going to present on our digital day at the MA Leeds Leadership Conference in March that's hosted through um, the Massachusetts Association of Curriculum and Development and MassQ on how we organize this day because other districts are looking to do a day similar to this. So it, it goes off really well. Can school committee members pay to attend <coughs> these? That sounds great. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, I'll email you the schedule. It's awesome. Uh, it, looks, oh, it's, it looks fantastic. It's such an amazing day. It's so awesome. Um, so from my teacher appointments um, and just tweeting and doing my blog every week and putting out different tools, um, recently Sarah Trainer, she's grade 7 science, she and I met and she had this beautiful um, assessment, the kids to uh, culminate life science in um, prokaryote and eukaryote and uh, defining whether something's a living being. They had to make a um, PSA for um, zombies, how to identify if, if it's a zombie. So she gave them like all different um, options and I went and met with her and we talked about those options and she gathered some from um, my, my blog that I put out and then we met and discussed and it went off and she said it was one of the best lessons. So that's some of her examples there that she did with her kids. And then if you can go on to the next one, you don't have to, they did like podcasts and videos and infographics. And then um, Amy Ronane this month to follow up with writing and how we're putting some of the technology in writing. It's hard to read that, but she's using this great tool called Wakelet. And um, it was a tool that I kind of showed her and then also tweeted it out. And then she's been working with it and having me in to see what the kids are doing. You can click it. And basically it's a collaborative space and she has the kids, um, they're doing their argumentative writing and they're having to provide evidence with uh, an Edgar Allan Poe story um, and you can scroll down and the kids post their work here and they can all see each other as they're posting uh, text and video and pictures of their persuasive. So she's giving them all different, you can stay on that one, all different ways to show their knowledge, but they're all putting it in this one common place and they can all see each other's work. So she's doing a really nice job with that. If you go back to my slide, you can click her other one. And this is another one where she had kids pull quotes from the text to provide um, contextual evidence to support a claim. They had to pretend they were attorneys. And so all the kids are writing on here and they're using all their quotes from different um, pieces of the passage and citing the page numbers. And the kids are really enjoying it and they can all see each other's work in this collaborative space. 
And then also to go with the writing, you can go back to the slide. Thanks, Jen. Going back to sixth grade, um, these teachers, you can see, I email them and I'm like, can I show that awesome thing you're doing? And so these are their emails back to me and they get all excited, of course. So um, Laura McPhee, grade six teacher, has been doing a writing lesson and she's using a tool, and she's gonna present it on our Tech PD Day, called um, Google Jamboard. And basically, it's an app that's on the student Chromebooks and it's on the board and it's basically like a whiteboard. And the kids can all, um, put their Fred or say more, that's some of the language in our writing program. And what she did is um, she had a code to the Jamboard, so only if their thought was really worthy of the Jamboard would they get the code. And then when it was real, they thought it was really good enough, they'd call her over and she'd give them the secret code and then they could put it on this board. And then from there she could stretch them and make them bigger or smaller so all the kids could see it, so they could really evaluate the writing and see like what flowed in this science open response. And she was saying to me today, because I said, I'm going to show it at school committee, and she said, um, be sure to tell them, like, this is something that when we used to do it before technology, like, we'd all be writing, and I'd have to run around, and I'd have to take one and put it up on an overhead, and it would just be so time consuming to get that feedback that now you're getting in such a, uh, you know, a flow in a more efficient manner. So that's how we're supporting writing with technology. And that's uh, what we're up to. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. yeah amazing is right. That's that's exactly the right word. Yeah. The really kids, uh, the kids, and the teachers are really amazing. It's it's just incredible. I, I'm so thankful to be a part of it. It's really great. How do they go about finding these apps? So you tell them some of them, but then they find some on their own. They do. So, um, Jam Google Jamboard. I did at a PLC. Um, and Wakelet, I also did at one of our PLCs. And then um, when I find a really good tool, I'll run to some of the teachers that I know are great catalysts to spread it. And I'll ask them if I can come in and work with them. And then sometimes they'll be working, um, like Sarah Trainer was working on a choice board she wanted. And she read a post that I had and took some of my tools and booked me to come in. And then she found a tool that she put on there just from, um, she went out to like Plymouth Public Schools and found something through them. And so I went and researched the tool and texted one of my tech director friends and was like, is this a, is this a safe tool to use? So I made sure it was, mm -hmm. you know, a good tool. And it was. So she taught me a new tool. It was great. Mm. Great. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job, Aaron. Nice job, Jen. Nice job, Deb. Rob, thank you for spending Valentine's Day with us. Yes. <laughs> now go home and Memorable. see your kids before they go to bed. Not you, Deb. You're still here. <laughs> Just kidding. If the superintendent doesn't have anything else, I will make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Uh, so moved. Moved by Gordon. Second. Second by Hazel. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank have you, a good night. Thank Happy you. Valentine's, Happy Valentine's Day. Day. What's left of it? Rob, did you sign all of these? And one of them twice.